Hey, real quick, uh, if you like what I'm doing on this channel and you want to help support it, I really appreciate it. There's a link in the description for my Patreon. You'll get uh, access to my weekly comic strip and um, exclusive videos from this channel. Thanks a lot. It's fat. <laughs> oh my gosh. Are they hardcover? Yes. So, uh, let's see if I can pull them out in order. Yeah, so here's volume one. Oh, yeah. So I, I did, just like with the Neat Stuff collection, I did original covers for each booklet. Here's <laughs> and uh, this is uh, the material from uh, Hate Annual, plus some extras. Oh, yes. Well, are there like interviews and essays and stuff like that in that volume? Uh, no, it, it, we actually pull anything that didn't, like something like Hate Island, mm -hmm. things like that. We stuck all that stuff in here. You know, oh, all those little standalone stories all went in here. Yeah, I, yeah, there was a few interviews. It's uh, and a few, yeah, like the buddy lookalike oh. contest and the stinky lookalike contest. I, forgot, I thought we were, I thought we were not going to use those, but I must have approved it. <laughs> yeah. I was a little bit worried about some of the, some of the like um, we talked about running all of the um, letters sections, but I was mainly not not for my sake, but for people who wrote these letters. You know, a lot of these letters from like 20, 30 years ago. And when I was rereading them, I just kept thinking, man, a lot of these people, I'm sure they're saying stuff that if you resurrect it, you could get them fired. <laughs> and did you put the covers all in one section like you did with the Neat Stuff collection? Or are they... Uh, yes. Boy, let me just... Where... Uh, I, well, you know, boy, I can't remember. <laughs> Spent so much time fussing over this, and now I'm trying to... Uh, yeah, the covers are all in the front. Cool. Oh man, that's such classic stuff. Yeah, and there are, yeah, there are some articles in here, some some of the press from the time when I made me and Jennifer Connolly made the cover of Entertainment Weekly. <laughs> Together, we were going to take over the entertainment world. It's probably selling pretty well. Don't you think so? I haven't asked. I used back. When I was still trying to get a career going, uh, I used to uh, grill Kim Thompson, especially constantly about the sales figures for every single issue of Hate and Neat Stuff. I wanted to know exactly what the sales figures were. And at a certain point, you know, when I became a has-been, I completely stopped asking. Do you really feel like you're a has-been? Why would you say that? Well, you know, it's officially no because i still get published i'm still working all the time i'm still making a living mm -hmm. so uh i really have no complaints but you know it's not nothing it's not on an upward trajectory you know hate is still like the best-selling thing i've ever done uh probably the only thing that comes close to that is of all things that margaret sanger book that seemed to have sold quite well you know and i know that that's been reprinted uh and i know just sim simply uh tabling at at uh, Comic Cons, uh, the, it's still to this day. It's the Hate Collections and that Sanger book are what sells more than anything else. I always sell out of them. I never seem to bring enough of any of that stuff. Although with the Sanger book, uh, it's almost always the same thing that happens. I don't know. It'll be like a woman anywhere between eighteen and forty. And I don't know if they already have it in mind that I'm the guy that did a book about Margaret Sanger, or if it just simply catches the corner of their eye, but they'll be walking along, zoom up to the table, pick up the book, give me the money, and then run away. And they don't even look at anything else on my table like they're going to get cooties if they <laughs> look at all the other crap I have on the table. 
uh, you've been with Fantagraphics since the very beginning, right? I mean, or I mean, since they started publishing comic books and not just the Comics Journal. Right. Yeah, I don't, I'm trying to remember if Love and Rockets was their very first comic book. It might not have been. Maybe it was. Yeah, but that would have been 82. So yeah, they had, at the time I met them, they had Love and Rockets. They had a comic called Hugo. Yeah, by Milton, Knight. Milton Knight. Yeah. yeah. And Don Rosa's comic. Do you know Don Rosa? Yeah, the Donald Duck artist. Yeah, yeah, he was doing a comic for them. Not, 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 yeah, it was like a regular comic book, but I don't think he did many of them. Uh, yeah, so I might have been like their fourth or fifth title. That would have been in 85. Yeah, but they still were very much, the company, it was still mostly devoted to cranking out the comics journal and Amazing Heroes. Amazing Heroes, if anything, that took up the production department. It seems like they spent most of their time doing Amazing Heroes because that came out, if I'm remembering correctly, that came out more often than the Comics Journal. And Kim, Kim, that seemed to be his baby. He was always working on that. And then he kept, and then Kim, he was more interested in anthologies than Gary Groth was. So they always had all these different anthologies. They had humor ones like Honk. Uh, they had ones that, you know, magazines about, wasn't there, a, was it called Nemo? About old yeah. comics? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and lots of short-lived anthologies like Zero Zero and things mm -hmm. like that. When you did uh, neat stuff for Fantagraphics, did was there any kind of like goodwill left over from like uh, being the editor of Weirdo? Like, did you bring any audience over that were, were picking up neat stuff because they recognized you already? Uh, I guess you know if people were going to be familiar with my work at all, prob comic book writers it probably would have been Weirdo. I only started editing Weirdo like a year, a year and a half before Neat Stuff came out. So it, it, in my mind, it seemed, and I was already doing comics that would eventually appear in the early issues of Neat Stuff around the same time. So it's, it, in my mind, it seemed like I was working on Weirdo and, and Neat Stuff at the same time. Labor-wise, I was doing both at the same time. And I wish, I really wish I could have kept doing Weirdo longer. It's just that trying to keep Need stuff coming out regularly. It just, it was, uh, Weirdo was suffering from it. I mm -hmm. kind of felt like uh, the quality was going down. I didn't, I was spending a lot of time and energy looking for new talent, new obscure work. And after a while, I was just sitting there waiting to see what would come to me, you know? After, if I hung in there, a lot of great work would have eventually come to me because all of a sudden, uh, Aileen wasn't, when she was editing it, she wasn't out there, you know, trying to drum up talent like the way I was. It just suddenly just snowballed. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was one issue, it was Weirdo number 25 that I guest edited. It was kind of like in the middle of her run. But I said, would you like a break and I'll do one? And she says, yeah, absolutely. And I was visiting with them. That was in winters. And uh, I said, do you have much many comics and she goes yeah she goes I even have a pile of worthwhile stuff she goes of course there's tons of stuff I'm not going to waste your time showing you but she, and it was huge it was like that and she goes here's a bunch of stuff that I think you might want to consider and a lot of it was great it was better than anything I was getting you know it was I'm trying to remember uh some a really great story by Glenn Head and mm -hmm. uh uh I reprinted a bunch of stuff by uh Doug Allen that old mm -hmm. uh, what was that guy? Steven. Steven, yeah. Was, that, of course. Which is, Steven was fantastic. Yeah, great that was such a fantastic comic. Yeah. And, and, and oh, actually, it was like a, it wasn't Steven. It was a comic that Doug Allen did that wasn't Steven. Huh. Uh, and um, <laughs> yeah, so I was like, wow, she's got it easy. This is really great. Uh, my, my favorite, though, I, a cartoonist who will go unnamed because I'm still, you know, I'm on friendly terms with him. But it was very funny when Aileen gave me this pile, this one, and, and I and I think I used work by the guy, but uh, he included a cover note and just like kissing Aileen's ass and going, Aileen, what you're doing with Weirdo, it's great. It's so much better than that shit that Peter Bag was doing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, I ran his, and I ran his comic anyway. <laughs> Peter, man. <laughs> Wow. Were you working at Barnes & Noble at the same time you were editing Weirdo? Or was that later? Oh, no, I, I quit by then. Uh, I, did, I once counted that 
I had 16, like starting when I was still in high school, I had 16 day jobs, some of which lasted for like a half an hour. And the last one was Barnes and Noble. And I worked there for like three and a half years. It was, it was very easy to do. I had, to, it was like uh, in Penn station. So a lot of the business was commuters. So I had to be there like at seven, seven thirty. Uh, but I just worked part-time by, by one o'clock by lunchtime, I would just go home and I lived like 10 blocks away. So I would walk home, eat lunch, and then spend the rest of the day just trying to learn to be a cartoonist. And, uh, and it was around that time, during that time, this would have been like 1979 to 1983. And that's when I got to know cartoonists like John Holmstrom and Ken Wiener and, and J.D. King and Bruce Carlton and did comics with them and got to know Art Spiegelman around that time too and Kaz and Drew Friedman. Uh, up until that time, I really didn't know anybody. There's this one cartoonist, I wish I could remember his name or, or his, what it, whatever his pen name was. Um, I just knew him as Buzzy. And Buzzy was a black guy with dreadlocks, a really good artist and a really nice guy. And he was a regular customer, a customer at, my, at the cafe my wife worked at. And he was the one that introduced me to Holmstrom and all these other people. He did, he did some drawings for Punk Magazine. And he was the one that got the, since he was actually a published cartoonist, like I think he had work in Creepy and Eerie. He drew a more real, he wasn't cartoony, he was more realistic. Uh, but uh, when my wife said, yeah, I'm, I'm inviting Buzzy over, you know, was, and I was like, you invited a real cartoonist to our house? I was terrified. I thought he was just going to look at my work and be like, tell me to kill myself or something because it was still so crude. But as soon as he looked at it, he says, uh, yeah, the guy that, do you know Punk Magazine? And I said, yeah, and I love it. He says, the guy that does that, he'll like your comics. And he was right. And, uh, and I, yeah, I can't remember Buzzy's name. He quit comics. He decided to make uh, jewelry instead. He met more, he met more women making jewelry <laughs> than doing comics. <laughs> you, you weren't really punk though, were you? Uh, you know, I liked all that punk rock new wave stuff. I didn't look, I wasn't cartoonish. Probably like the one thing that would have made me look punk compared to the average person my age back then is like as soon as I moved to New York City in 77, I cut my hair short and kept it this short ever since. Because uh, back then in the 70s, even like amongst, you look at even punk bands like the Talking Heads and the Ramones, of course, and Blondie, they had long hair. The men still had long hair. Uh, it was only a handful of people that were cutting their hair short. And that alone made me like look kind of new wavy. But I, I like that music, but I wasn't very much a part of the scene. I, I'm not a live music guy. So I yeah. didn't go to clubs much. There were, and there, there was a bit of a, there was this divide between like punk, like real punk rock and, uh, and new wave. And uh, so and the, there were clubs that catered to the two different, sounds and sensibilities and i really hated going to punk rock clubs punk rock clubs it was all all these guys were just and women were they were just like uptight fucked up goofballs who got picked on in college and now they put on or in high school now they put on a leather jacket and are trying to convince you that they're tough there was this constant just because of the fucking leather. I hate, as soon as somebody put on a leather jacket, I immediately hated them because I knew they immediately caught this attitude. My older brother did that. He suddenly bought a leather jacket, wore it every single day. It had all the little lapel pins mm -hmm. with his favorite bands on it, wore it every single day. And it was just, it did something to his personality that I, that I found so annoying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With, with the new wave clubs. First of all, the girls at the New Wave clubs were so cute. There were a million times, they would wear colors, you know, they'd wear those colored stockings and have cool haircuts and the really short skirts. And they, and they were nicer. They were so much nicer and smarter than the punk rock girls who were just like, bleh, bleh. <laughs> <laughs> So I did, for that, just to look at the girls, I liked the punk rock clubs so much more. And, and I generally, I liked those bands better. I like Devo and Talking Heads mm -hmm. and the B-52s. I mean, I like the Ramones too, but the, the new wavy bands that I just mentioned, they were my favorites, you know. But did working at Punk Magazine give you any kind of street cred? No, mainly because at the time I met them, 
well, because pretty much by then, I guess the only people that Holmstrom could rely on to help him get this magazine out were other cartoonists. Mm -hmm. He didn't start it out with, he started out with a guy named Lex McNeil, who I know, he's a writer. He wrote that book, Please Kill Me, which oh, is yeah. a great, fantastic book about yeah. the history of punk. And I liked him okay, but back then he was he was like a raging alky and, and just nothing but trouble. If I'd see, like if I, he used to go to art openings, like a friend of mine who, I knew a lot of fine artists because I went to the School of Visual Arts. My wife and I would get invited to a, a gallery opening and uh, legs would always be there, not because he liked the fine art, but because there was free alcohol. <laughs> And he would always do it when I'd be like, oh, crap, Legs is there. I'd always ask the same thing because I know what he'd say. I'd go, what do you think of the art? And he'd always go, and he wasn't even joking. He'd go, what art? <laughs> <laughs> and he'd always do the same thing. He'd look around for the biggest guy in the room and try to get that guy to beat the shit out of him. Yeah. He'd go, Pete, what did you say about that guy? What did you say? Fortunately for me, it never worked. The The big guy never took the bait. But. Yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, that's what who Holmstrom was stuck with. But after a while, it was mainly this guy, Bruce Carlton. I don't know if you've ever seen, yeah. familiar with his artwork. Fantastic yeah. artist and a really nice guy. And he, more than anybody else, really helped Holmstrom get it out. Anyhow, when it, by the time I met them, nobody knew it, but the last issue of Punk had already come out. You know, it was just something happened with financing. I don't know who his backers were, but the rug got pulled out from under him. So I did appear in a magazine called Punk, but it came later. It's like Punk as an ongoing entity, it was, it was dead. But then there was a movie, a documentary called DOA, mm -hmm. and somebody hired Holmstrom to put out an issue of Punk, but the point of that issue of Punk was to help promote the movie. But Holmstrom do some comic. Holmstrom really liked that character, uh, Studs Kirby. So he was always sticking, he'd always use anything with Studs Kirby, he'd always stick in there. Like when the, him and J.D. King were doing Stop Magazine. Yeah. That's pretty much all they wanted from me. I was always trying to get, I said, well, what about this? And look at this new, I'm working on this new comic. They're like, no, just do Studs Kirby. <laughs> you know what's so funny about your work is that uh, I remember when I first discovered you. So first, I found out about your comics through that movie Kids. Because uh, that guy with the character, Casper, was reading Hate. In his oh, movie. Jesus Christ, yeah. <laughs> so, and I saw that movie when the I was... The rapist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Basically, like, you know, I, then I related to Buddy Bradley when I was uh, in my early 20s. And now, <laughs> I'm a married guy, and I relate to Chet and Bunny Leeway. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff that nobody wants to read about. It's uh, so I was I was explaining to somebody recently, like when somebody was asking me, uh, well, I've been getting asked this a lot. Why don't you bring back Buddy Bradley? Why don't you revive him? And I said, well, I was doing those hate annuals. And by then, Buddy was domesticated. He was married with a kid. I mean, he was a weird married dad, but mm -hmm. he was married with a kid. Nobody gave a shit. Nobody wants to read about that stuff. They want to read about 20-somethings and love triangles. And I was telling that to somebody recently, and that person was going, uh, yeah, you know what? I wouldn't want to read a comic about me now. I only want to read about 20-somethings getting laid. <laughs> <laughs> People who grew up reading Hate, uh, they, they weren't reading Hate Annual. I'd be going to comic conventions, and they said, you should keep doing Hate. And I was like, I am. You know, for 10 years after Hate officially ended, I'd always make a point of putting out one issue of Hate called Hate Annual. And nobody heard of it. You know, it was, obviously it wasn't selling as well. So all these diehard hate fans, they were not looking for it. And when I'd look at them, I could see why. It's like, okay, so you are Buddy Bradley. You're in your 30s now. You probably got a mortgage. Why would you make that effort to go downtown to the local, one of the few comic shops that would carry hate and hope that it's still in stock? It's, it's absurd for you to make that effort. Why would you? And, and and that's why older people it just uh, it they stop paying attention. And plus, they didn't. I guess they didn't. Want, when you hit that age, you don't want to read about yourself anymore. Your life is boring. <laughs> are you are you still doing stuff for Reason Magazine, or is that over? Yes. No. Uh, um, 
the current editor, and so long as she's the current, remains the editor, she has me regularly doing just these four page biographical comics. I've, I've pretty much only just started, that she might have run like four of them. And part of it was inspired by the fact that I was doing these full length biographical comics. And she says, you've gotten pretty good at that. So she was, I know that there's a big difference between a full book and just four pages, but if you could either so I go back and forth between condensing someone's whole life in four pages or maybe just focus on one event or one specific aspect of the person's life, assuming they had a big life. And uh, um, and part of the reason that I'm just doing that too is I was, I don't know if it's just me getting old or what, but I have another theory, but I was having a harder and harder time playing journalist. I was having a really hard time being a journalist. It used to be when I started doing this, even if it was, I was going to talk to somebody that I had nothing in common with, the person might have even, if they knew Reason Magazine or and hated it or knew my work and hated it, people would still say, yeah, sure, everybody wanted to talk. And uh, again, it's one of the countless things where I blame social media. Now everybody's really cagey. Everybody's really savvy and they, if somebody is involved with anything remotely political, whether they're an activist or a bureaucrat, they are so cagey. And they're like, what are you gonna ask me? What are you gonna ask about? They're really, really suspicious. And all of a sudden I just could not get uh, face-to-face meetings with anybody. Everybody was blowing me off. Um, or not, well, almost everybody. So, so it was taking me forever. I was spending so much time just just trying to find someone to talk to, you know, because I have to draw somebody, you know, it's like maybe they will talk to me via email, but I'm not going to draw emails, you know, I have to see the person. And that's the other thing, too, is uh, I, I don't think it's something with a lot of people at, when I started out, but now it's like, oh, you're going to turn me into a cartoon. I'm going to be a cartoon and that. I would like to be taken seriously. Yeah. And that was the last one, the very last uh, journalistic type strip that I did. Um, it had to do with one of the uh, immigration detention centers. Mm-hmm. There's one in downtown Tacoma. So I did a story about that. And and there were two sets of groups who were protesting it. And one were like these people who were like churchy people. They tended to be older. They're upset about everything that's happening with immigrants and the way they're being treated, but they have this one approach about how to help them and how to deal with them and what they could do. And then there are people who are much hard left, really radical left, who are just burn it all down, you know, and they would have protests where all hell would break loose and you'd get Antifa guys showing up and just tear, trying to tear down the fences of this prison. Um, and these two groups hated each other the the hard left people and these nice old ladies they really even though you would think they're on the same side that just their approach is so different that they hated each other and at one point while i was talking to one of the older women who were you know these older conservative women church ladies and i and i said yeah so i was talking to these people from the, from the radical group and she goes she said you're talking to them and i go yeah she goes they're going to be in your comic strip and I go, yeah. And she goes, I don't want to be in the same comic strip as them. <laughs> <laughs> so if she did. Of course, I wound up drawing her saying that. I drew her saying, I don't want to be in the same comic strip as those people. Because that was the funniest thing I thought anybody ever said to me. <laughs> when you're, did you actually uh, put together that, that hate collection? Or was that just they already had the files and they were just going to compile them into one book. Yeah, well, they a lot of it they had on file because they keep reprinting, you know, like those book collections, Buddy Does Seattle and Buddy Does Jersey. They they had the art from that on file. The only thing that we had to do a bit of cobbling together with was somehow they didn't have all the color files because in, in this, with Buddy Does Jersey, that collection, we made it black and white. And that was my choice, uh, mainly because I always felt a little bit bad about the color because I thought, it slightly obliterated Jim Blanchard's inking, mm. you know? So I thought, well, here's a chance for people to really take in uh, the really nice inking job he did. Uh, you know, and they could just stole the old comic books if they want to see it in color. But this time it's like, no, we should bring the color back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Fantagraphics, for whatever reason, and this is, 
this happens a lot with everybody. The files get corrupted or they just, who knows what happens, they just disappear. So my wife, Joanne, she had to recolor, I think one issue, she had to recolor almost all of it and here and there, you know, which she, you know, she didn't mind doing. Is it painful at all to look at your old work when you have to like go back and it, it goes back and forth. Some, uh, you know, sometimes it's, you know, like with this, of course, with this hate collection, I wound up revisiting a lot of my old work, that work. And sometimes I'd look at it and I'd go, why didn't I redraw this? What the hell? Why was I so lazy? And sometimes I, and I would remember there's a few, I don't want to point them out, but I can remember at the time, like I inked it, I'd be looking at it and I'd be think, I'd be thinking at the time I should redraw that and then go, nah. <laughs> and it's still, it's like, what the hell is wrong with me? And, and, and another thing, my biggest general complaint about, especially the earlier hates is they're very verbose. There's a lot of words in one way. That's a good thing. Cause that's how people talk. Yeah. People blather on, but you know, brevity is wit, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and I'm still to this day, I'm still always, it wasn't just hate. It was everything I did. It was just way too wordy. And I'm still fighting to make the wording, uh, the writing part, more concise no more of these gigantic never-ending word balloons yeah. yeah word balloons with run-on sentences in them <laughs> yeah what is he he said uh art spiegelman says that he thinks that a comic each word balloon should have at most four lines of, of, of words of right. us. Yeah. or a sentence you yeah know? Right. It, 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 rather than have two sentences one word balloon two word balloons you know, mm, yeah. which is something I'm, I, even if like something's an afterthought, like if somebody says blah, 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 I think that little, I think I'll yeah. stick that in its own. <laughs> it's also, it also helps like the rhythm of it too. Like when people read right. it like that. Right. Where there's, where there is a pause. Yeah. It yeah. Gives it yeah. At least, you know, um, right. but when you reread that stuff, are you kind of removed from it enough that you can read it and not feel like you're the person who did it? Well, the, well, to go back to like, do I feel differently? Every now and then I'll see something that I drew from the past, where I'm like, well, that's really good. I'll even wonder, could I pull that off again? Some, certain things just look really good. Uh, and when I feel like a bit disconnected from it, it's just because I was a younger person when I was drawing it. It was much full of piss and vinegar. Or it's, you know, that's a, it's, I wasn't full of piss and vinegar. I just had more home hormones. I was a younger man then. And it just it exaggerates and exacerbates everything, you know? And, and I sense that. When I would read the letter pages or reread the letter pages, especially from a weirdo, I'd be like, who is this guy? Who is this asshole? <laughs> so pissed off about everything. Uh, there was, with that guest, when I did that special guest edition of Weirdo, I think it was, uh, I think it was in Weirdo. Maybe it was the first issue of Hate, and now I can't remember. But I wrote an editorial talking about uh, it was switching from the 1980s to the 1990s. We're entering a new decade. But I was talking about the 80s suck so hard that the 90s can only be worse. And I already dubbed it the I wish we were all dead decade. <laughs> then it turns out the 90s were fine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> The, the last good decade, but I, I reread that and I was like, why was, and I could tell that I meant it. I was like, why was I so convinced that the, that everybody was going to want to kill themselves in the 1990s? Was that in a weirdo? I think it was, yeah. And of course, part of me was, I was trying to be funny, but also I could tell by reading it, it's like, oh, this relentless negativity, you know? Mm. Yeah, I had the same same exact thing when I look at my old work. I'm like, why was I so hateful? Everything was just, like, I would do a comic. It would just be, like, a list of things that I hated. Right. I was like, who even wants to read this? Right. Well, something I've said a million times is uh, that expression, oh, he's a bitter old man. Mm -hmm. Old men are, tend to be mellow. It's, young men are bitter. Yeah. Young men are the most bitter people in the world. <laughs> And I'm including, I w I'm including my young man self in that category, you know? Yeah. Just perpetually aggrieved over something, you know? Well, how, uh, how old were you when you got married? Well, I've been with my wife since I was 19. 
so we've been together for like 43 i'm losing count oh my god three yeah 43 years and uh, but we got married in uh, january of 83 so 37 years so yeah a long time how did i mean you were <laughs> how do you make a marriage work when you're a cartoonist like <laughs> how does that work man oh we get along okay i mean and we both we actually both like being at home and since my uh my daughter now is uh well she's pregnant and so she was a teacher but now she's gonna take she's taking a leave of back she's gonna take a year off and her husband works at home he does computer games he's a video game engineer but he even before the lockdown he was working at home and they like it too they both like being in the same house together all the time too i know some people really struggle with that but we like it just fine. It's, it's so well, like, again, like for us, and I suppose this is probably true with a lot of cartoonists and their spouses. Uh, when this lockdown first happened, it didn't feel that different. You know, right. we would, you know, when we'd leave the house, I mean, we're like a walking distance to a really good grocery store. I mean, we don't, where we would live, we'd always pick these places where we don't have to drive anywhere, you know. Well, this year, like I guess like a lot of people, I don't think we're, we're even gonna put a thousand miles on our car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but normally we usually, it'd be like 3,000 miles a year. We would always deliberately move to a place where there was lots of amenities that were really close. And yeah, and uh, so we would only get in the car to uh, go to the movies or try a restaurant that is outside of walking distance. And now we're not even doing that but it just doesn't, doesn't really feel like that big a deal. Every now and then we'll get a little bit claustrophobic and it's like, oh, let's go somewhere. But yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's, I guess we're just okay that way, you know? When you were young and you were married and you were trying to be a cartoonist, did you feel like you had to hustle really hard to, to make sure that you could make cartooning a career? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I had to prove myself because my wife was supporting me, but also it's what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. you know? And I used to, back then, like when I was working with Crumb, he used to give me really good advice, which when I repeated, what he was saying would be obvious. But when I'd complain about it, I was like, I'm, I'm working morning, noon, and night, and I'm still hardly making any money. And Crumb would say, and he's absolutely right, I could vouch for it, like with this collection. He used to say, Pete, you live off of the sweat of your youth. He says, what you're doing now, you're going to be making money off of it for decades to come. So yeah, it's not all pouring it now, but eventually it will. It was, you just gotta stick with it. Just hang in there and keep wow. working. Yeah, I, I again, I don't, crank, like you seem to be a workaholic. I don't crank it out well, nearly as much as I I'm used still, to. I'm still in that era of my life where I, I'm doing what I have to do. I'm trying to, no, okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm still hustling, I feel like. And I feel like I'm still trying to build up enough of a body of work that maybe it could be reprinted. But the, the problem I'm having right now with my comics is that I, I don't want to do any more historic or like biographical graphic novels. I want to just do, I want to get back to writing fiction or just having fun and not think about what the next historic person, I'm. because how do you make money? You know, like if I wanted to, to pitch a, a fiction graphic novel to a, to a bigger publisher that actually had money, they're not going to take it. So like I, right now I'm like, I need to think about what the next book is going to be that I can make money off of. And I can't. Well, do you think maybe at this point, like doing historical and biographical work, you think it might be at least to some degree a fad that after a while, the publishers will want fiction, something more outside of the normal. You think they'd be open to everything, you know? Yeah. But I feel but like they, if I pitched Abrams, like a, a fiction book, you know, from my perspective, it's like, yeah, you want to do this because this is the stuff that you can actually sell to streaming services, right? Like, you're not going to sell the rights to Joseph Smith to Netflix. Right. Yeah, like, no, exactly. You want, like, an right. original story, and that's right. what I want to do because those are, like, muscles, like, artistic muscles that I want to flex. Like, I want to get back into right. learning how to write and, and doing those things. I don't yeah. want to... No, that is, a, that is a problem when it comes to... Yeah, when I... Especially... It's happened with the other biographical books, but... Uh, but yeah, I actually did get phone calls from producers who'd say, so do you own the rights to Margaret Sanger? <laughs> like, <laughs> no, nobody does. <laughs> yeah. um, and they're like, oh, huh, okay. And it's like, I probably should come up with some bunch of BS to keep you on the phone, try to squeeze yeah. some money out of you. 
Um, That's the thing. I, right? I remember Pisker did that. It Pisker when all this, when Hip Hop Family Tree came out and it, and was really popular and there's a lot of buzz. And I said, "Is there showbiz interest?" And he says, "Well, uh, he goes, I sold the rights to the name to some production company." I said, "So they did? You sold?" He was, "Yes." So they have, you know, they can do whatever they want with electronic media with the name Hip Hop Family Tree. He goes, "They gave me money for that." And I go, "You didn't want more than that?" And he's like. He's like, I don't own the Beastie Boys <laughs> and exactly. Salt and Pepper. It's like, exactly. he goes, I don't know what they're thinking. Uh, yeah. He goes, yeah. He goes, I couldn't. There was nothing else. He goes, that was the only thing I could option was the title. Yeah. You know? I mean, I feel like I, I've, when the Joseph Smith book is done, I feel like that's about all the historical figures I really have a passion to even get into telling their story. Right. Like, I don't, I don't want to. Although the other day, me and Mark Newgarden were, were trying to work out a story of, we wanted to do a graphic novel about Bob Kane. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> we were talking to publishers about that, and they're like, do you know how litigious Bob Kane's family is? There's like no way really? you're going to get away uh, with that. And so also, it's like, you're talking about Batman. So then, like, do you want DC, do you think DC Comics is going to let these people come and soil their, their brand, you know? You know, it's that's just. I've never heard. I've never heard a good thing about him. Oh, I know. That's what's so fun about it. You know what I mean? Like written by Mark Newgarden. Like that would be. A whole thing. I would love to do that. Yeah. So no, that would be great. Yeah, that's why I would want to do that. But actually, the truth is, like, I do have to be interested in the person. Like, you know, the Joseph Smith book is something I wanted to do for a long time. Yeah, my uh, my first book deals were actually were. They literally were graphic novels. They originally were, they'd be serialized, but like Apocalypse Nerd and uh, Reset and Other Lives were all actual yeah. fiction. They were, they were real novels. Um, but uh, yeah, but since then, it's just been all the, I, I didn't realize that, it didn't occur to me that uh, historical or biographical comics were becoming such a thing. In a way, it makes sense, because when you think about the most popular, most famous graphic novels of all, they're almost all memoirs, mm-hmm. you know, like Mouse and Persepolis and Fun Home. They're all memoirs, you know, and they're famous and they sold great. Right. I assume they all did. But if you're like a straight white guy, you, you're not going to get a big royalty check to tell your life oh. story. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, uh, Bill Griffith, well, he did that salacious story about his mom. <laughs> that was fanographics, though, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. That was- well, but it's, Invisible Ink was... Uh, Abrams. No, no, that was Fanographics. He did, uh... The, the yeah, other one was... He did Schlitzie with Abrams? Yeah, Schlitzie's with oh. Abrams, and so is uh, the Bushmiller book that he's doing now. Oh, okay. Yeah, those are biographical. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, oh, well. It's kind of this nightmare where it's like, can I just, like, write a story? Can I get back to doing that? Like, I don't want to... Please. I... <laughs> what was your, like, worst... Because you had so many options, right, for your comics from Hollywood? Yeah. Do you have like a terrible story you can tell me about one of those dealings? Oh, geez. Yeah, there was one guy uh, who I hope he doesn't see this. And he, there was like usually hate and or Buddy Bradley is usually optioned and or a development deal. But there's this one guy, real young guy, real slick talker, you know, exaggerated his, you know, I kind of, but so did my agent. He kind of snookered my agent too into thinking, he was going to do this, make an animated hate movie. And he seemed like a nice guy. I enjoyed talking to him on the phone. Again, like a real fast talker, obviously. But, uh, he, you know, at one point he flew me down and we did the rounds. But he, before he even came down, he says, there are these two um, Russian guys, these two young Russian guys who have an animation company based in Russia. And uh, he goes, and they're great. And he says, they already, he was on spec. They're going to do, when we go and pitch it, we could bring these little uh, uh, animated hate things. And it at least would be, but I said, I don't know if I'm going to like what they're going to do. And he goes, it doesn't matter. I said, yeah, I don't want, if we go pitching it, and I'm not crazy about this animation that these guys did, um, I don't want them attached. And also, if I don't like it, I don't want to show it. I don't want to give whoever we're pitching to the fu- a false impression that this is what the show will look like. Uh, he was, yeah, no, no, don't worry about it. So these Russian guys did it, and they were terrible. You know, it was like they gave every character they gave this, they gave everybody, everybody had a body that was like, even like Lisa 
and stinky. Everybody had a body like they were Uncle Sam on stilts. <laughs> <laughs> they were all gangly. So I said, I don't want to show when we, so, fun, you know, and I was trying to work with these guys. You know, I would make, no, it goes, make it more like this, make it more like that. You know, the real note I wanted to say is blow your brains out. You know, just stop doing this. And, and, and the guy kept promising me, he says, no, we won't show it. You know, he goes, I know you're not happy with it. So we come down. The two Russian guys were with him. And I don't know what the story of these two guys. I mean, they were nice enough guys, but the way they looked and dressed, they looked like they were the sons of Russian mafiosi or oligarchs, you know? They looked like they had a lot of money and they were just trying to buy their way into Hollywood. And and he kept bring and I kept telling them, I don't want to show their cartoon and I don't want them coming along. Yeah, it's like that'll automatically, they'll become convinced that they're attached. And I don't want to be attached to them because I don't like their animation. And, and, but I'd meet him and he's like, all right, you know, I'll be in my hotel. And he goes, meet me at uh, Amazon. You know, we went to Amazon, we went to Netflix, you know, all the usual. Uh, and I kept saying, don't bring those guys. And he'd be, he'd be like, okay, I won't. And there they'd be. And at least for the most part, their English wasn't so good, so they didn't talk much. But at one point, like at Netflix, the honchos at Netflix started asking these Russian guys questions. And they're asking them questions like, it's just assumed they're going to animate it. Mm -hmm. And they said, how, they said, how quick a turnaround can you do? Like if we do a half an hour animated show, uh, how quick a turnaround could you give us? And they went 48 hours. And, uh, <laughs> and two things. One, it's like they were either lying or maybe they were telling the truth, but it was going to be the worst looking thing imaginable, you know, and nobody needed to hear that. They didn't want to hear that. They probably would have been thrilled with, you know, two weeks, you know, and, uh, and yeah, even the Netflix people were like looking at each other and looking at me and I'm like, holy fucking shit. <laughs> but somebody, Amazon, Amazon said, yeah, we're interested. I guess you could say it's a blessing in the skies, although it would have been great to get a deal with Amazon. Amazon was interested. Now we're in the negotiation phase. We're going to get a development deal. And this guy, this young guy who was bringing the Russians along, he was, when the negotiations started, he demanded everything. He just, he wanted like a gazillion trillion dollars. He was just asking for weight. Not only was he, like the Amazon people were like, this guy you came up with, he's crazy. He's asking for way too much. And I said, well, you could get him. You know, he's starting big. They go, no, he won't come down. They said, you don't understand. He's demanding that we give him the rights to hate. He wants, what you, well, we don't even own the rights to hate. You do. He wants us to give him your property. <laughs> <laughs> And my agent was like, yeah, he goes, don't worry, I'll fix this. I'll delve in. And he came back and he goes, this is the most insane thing I've ever seen in my life. He, he's like, he's literally asking for the sun and the moon and he won't back down. You know, he's like, he wants, like, he's asking for like a million dollar advances, you know, a signing bonus, a million bucks. <laughs> oh, so yeah, that was that. That was the end of that. But yeah, he wanted a horror story. There you go. That was a oh. horror story. Is that the last time you had a dealing with Hollywood for the hate? No, I, I had stuff stuff since then. I had another after that. He had some God. I don't want to name names, but it turns mm -hmm. out, like with this last one, it was, I have a writing partner that I work with a lot, and he was, and we were, we had a development deal. We were getting paid to write a script again for Buddy Bradley hates or teenage, it's either teenage Buddy Bradley, like from Neat Stuff, or 27 Buddy Bradley. And we were doing it, I don't want to name okay. the person, because uh, a lot of people I know work with them, but mm -hmm. uh, we start working on it. And after a while, my writing partner, who would see this guy, he'd meet with him, because they were talking about other projects as well. I could tell my partner was being really cagey, and it seemed like he was standing between me and that guy, the, the rep from, the production company and it was a big company a big famous company and i'm like and i was getting mad it's like what's going on what's going on with this guy and you keep acting like you don't want me to talk to him it's right finally the deal died you know we got paid in full you know as this always is the case got paid in full but then finally uh he goes well now that the deal is done i could tell you as soon as the 
ball started rolling, he says, my, my friend was like saying, I knew that as long as we finished it, we get paid in full. But as soon as the ball started rolling, this other guy, he was just saying, you know what? I don't really want to do hate. I don't like hate. I don't like working with Pete. Um, I, let's, and he kept meeting with my friend trying to do something else. He says, I knew all along that uh, he was going to kill the show, but I didn't want to take the wind out of your sails. Yeah. You know? But I was like, I really wish that you did tell me because for one, you were making me really paranoid. And two, I would have finished it. I want to get paid. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, it's like, it probably would have, we probably would have had a blast. We probably would have written a masterpiece if we both knew that it was dead <laughs> and in the water. <laughs> probably would have written the craziest thing imaginable, you know? <laughs> but doesn't that, isn't that good though? To just have, I mean, this has been going on for almost your whole career, hasn't it? But like, just like the old like like mid nineties, mid nineties is when Hollywood started calling. Yeah. And it just keeps going, but then the, at least you're getting paid and they're not making a crappy thing out of your yeah. company. Well, what, I, um, what always happens is the same thing. It's like, you might get some very, I've never got like a big option fee, uh, but you get decent development fees, like 50,000 bucks to write, which is great. You know, you could live on that for a year. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, to write and do the Bible and all that kind of stuff. And uh, at every single time I reach that point, I get a deal, a development deal. I keep telling myself, just you know, go with the flow. Don't worry about anything. The money is guaranteed. You're going to get the money. Just take it easy. Go with the flow. Don't let anything get to you. And every single time I lose my fucking mind. These people drive me crazy. Um, they, they, they always so get under my skin. I don't know if they're doing it on purpose or if they're just all, if it's a city full, it's an industry full of total fucking sociopath assholes, but they drive me out of my mind every single time. I've never had a pleasant experience. I mean, there's been like, like the guy that I write with a lot. I like him a lot. We've partnered on scripts pretty often. You know, he's a friend. So yeah, and I like working with him. There's in the past, there's been friends I worked with that I didn't like. That's the worst is when you go enter Hollywood land with a friend. Yeah. Uh, and then and you wind up wanting to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but it's all the other people. It's just like it's um it's like I realized like even my friend, I just to to spare my feelings and to keep my spirits up, he was lying to me. <laughs> he lied, it, but he's a good friend, and I'll still work with him. But I, at that point, I like when he told me what was really going on behind the scenes. I was like, okay, it's official. Literally, every single person I deal with in Hollywood lies to me. They yeah. every single person lies to me. They all lie, and. I cannot say that about comics. It's the weirdest thing in comics. I might think somebody is a pain in the ass and a jerk, but at least they don't lie their fucking asses off to my face, you know? I've never once, in all of my dealings with comics, with the publishing world, I've never entered a deal with a lawyer or an agent. Never, because I never felt like I needed one, you know? Who knows, maybe I'd be better off, but it's just, never, you know, I get a contract. Somebody will say, here's the advance, here's a page rate. And uh, that sounds good. <laughs> Can you still write Team Buddy Bradley or like the the twenty? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm the, I'm actually doing. That. I'm gonna do a short. I, this is sound. This is so weird. It's those. I sound so weird when it comes out of my mouth. I'm gonna do like a short Buddy Bradley story, like nostalgia Buddy Bradley, going back to Seattle, 1990, for the New Yorker. <laughs> Congratulations, man! That's great. I know, I keep saying the average New Yorker reader is going to open it up and think their magazine has cancer, you know? It's like, what the fuck is this? Well, that's awesome. And yeah, what, well, yeah. I mean, the whole oh, thing about hate is that, uh, wasn't it sort of just like um, like amazingly good timing that it became as popular as it did because it came out and all of a sudden, in the right time, like in this music scene that was happening and this whole thing that was happening? And, Right. Yeah. Yeah, of course. It's probably, it's the only time in my whole career where I had paid her, you know, mm-hmm. in, in that sense. It's 
you know, it's, like I said, it's the most, by far the most popular thing I've ever done, you know, for all of those reasons that you're talking. And very often it's embarrassing, especially when, I mean, I'm not surprised that especially younger people at that time totally assumed it, but it's really embarrassing when people assume that I was like jumping on grunge's coattails. Because when it's, when I started doing hate, that word didn't even exist. And none of those bands were famous, but it was only like a year, a year and a half later where it all became this big phenomenon. And I was already doing it. And, and it didn't boost sales at all. The very first issue of Hate sold really well. For an alternative comic book, the very first issue sold really well. And the sales never went up, you know? So even at the height of all that grunge bullshit, it, none of that trickled down to me at all. It's like, it was still, the, it, it was all the same. Yeah. So if I was trying to exploit that scene, it totally backfired on me. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, did you notice that a lot of other artists were ripping off your style? I, I could see some people would, would be influenced by, by me. And lots of times I didn't even have to guess. A lot of times they would tell me. Mm -hmm. you know, they'd be like apologetic. They'd send me a copy of their comic and go, I'm really inspired by you. Hope you don't think uh, this is a ripoff. But I, I can't think of any instance where I looked at somebody's work and got annoyed. You know, mm -hmm. like, whoa, what, what is this person doing? This is getting way too close for comfort. You know, I always saw a pretty big gap, you know. Well, there were a lot of slacker comics around that time. Yeah, yeah, and some, of the, yeah, well, if, if there was a, if I had much of a problem with it, it's like, is if, is, and I'm not saying this was always the case, but it just, if the writing wasn't very good, you mm -hmm. know, that was the beginning, in the 90s, all of a sudden there was alternative comics, so many of them were autobiographical comics, and where just the character was so the main character who is either literally was the cartoonist or an obvious stand in. Yeah. And the person who's just always going, mm, mm. <laughs> you always want to slap them around. It's like, oh my God. Yeah. You know, it's, it's your, your beings. I don't know if you're this boring in real life. I won't live with you, but <laughs> you're making yourself so boring. And just, and yeah, that was that tended to be, I'm not saying there was like a ton of this, but that was a bit of a problem of this kind of woe is me, mm -hmm. you know, bore me. It just was, it just was boring. All right, man. Well, thanks a lot for giving me your time. I know it's dinner time for you. Right. Yes. All right. Well, that was fun. It was great talking to you and good luck with uh, all your comics. You're doing great work. You're really impressed. Yeah. Thanks. I'm going to write to Emily and see if I can get a copy of that complete hate. Okay, good luck. I was she might be like, uh, <laughs> the postage alone is going to make the graphics. <laughs> All right, man. Have a good night. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, bye, bye. In 2017, I began drawing an autobiographical comic strip for a newspaper in Columbus, Ohio to mass acclaim. Now, the good folks at Fantagraphics Books have collected those incredible comics inside one perfect little book. Please Don't Step on My Jinko Jeans is sure to be your favorite book of the current hellscape of 2020. This collection will never be reprinted again, and the print run is low. Hit that link in this video's description and get your copy now. Thanks a lot.